<laughs> I hated her uh, from I, which I just hated the way that she, the, the actress played Miss Deagle. Like it was just over the top, like an old school Ebenezer Scrooge type character. I I just did. It took away the belief. You know, she, I'm gonna I'm gonna get that dog and I'm gonna kill it. I just I hated it. We have an hour and forty minutes with most of it being gremlin attacks, but yet you want to spend thirty minutes developing Rudy Deagle. Remember when we first met John McClane? Our guy picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked ass. We're gonna die. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when growing up really that good? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. My name is Roger Roper, or The Raj, alongside my co-host, Big D, Dick Ebert. We take a look back in time and decide if our favorite movies from the 80s and 90s still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from our four movie choices, and we break out our race car VHS tape rewinders and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. This week, we reviewed the classic 1984 movie Gremlins. Oh, I'm a happy boy today. Happy, 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 because the... uh, I, I don't know if people are trying to torment us, but Cocktail was winning right up yeah. until the end, and the idea of Watching Cocktail tonight was was not appealing. We've been doing this podcast now for four weeks, and every single movie in my mind was better than <laughs> what it actually is. No, th- this one, this is the first time I'm watching it, and I'm remembering it, and it's living up to the hype. So th- this was a no. good week. What, you didn't think so? This should be a good episode, but before we dive into the episode, uh, we do want to... Uh, give a shout out to our reviews. The best way that we can move up the charts on iTunes is through listener feedback like yourself. So whether you want to send us a, a review on iTunes or an email at hosts at shatthemovies.com, we'd like to, to read those back to you. So how many well, did we get this week? I, I don't know. I'm total for the week, but I'm impressed. We've been now on iTunes for you know, like four minutes. Now it's like maybe 15 days when we're recording this and we have 19 reviews. Average of 4.79 stars, which which is phenomenal. I really appreciate people taking the time and actually giving us a little love because it helps us and helps other people find us and helps build our listenership. So it means a lot. I appreciate it. All right. So the first five-star review that we'll read off actually comes from Brazil. Uh, I don't know how to say this. I'm going to – I'm gonna. is it Googie Zera? Googie Zera? Sounds good. All right. Googie Zera writes, great podcast. Very nostalgic and fun. Now I find myself looking for the theme songs to listen to. Thanks, Googie Zara. Uh, next one we got a four star from Rooster RJ Lover, who said, uh, fun and refreshing. First heard these guys from another podcast, Fear What, uh, which is also one of my favorites. These guys are down to earth. Love reliving my childhood with them every week. Uh, thanks, guys, and keep them coming. Thanks, Rooster RJ Lover. Uh, another five star review comes from Cypherman42. He writes, Kelly LeBrock was my crush. Obviously, uh, he listened to our Weird Science podcast. He says, you guys ruined one of my favorite 80s movies. I know that watching it now, it's pretty bad. But watching it when I was in high school, we never laughed so hard. It's amazing how politically incorrect 80s movies were. You guys are spot on. Thanks for the trip down memory lane. Keep up the good work. This is a perfect podcast to listen to while working. You guys are hilarious. Thanks, Cypherman42. And then I got an email from uh, Maria M. Who wanted to request that we do coming to America. So I I did add that to our list. So if you go to the website, you'll see that this week's poll is up and uh, the movies that we have on there now for her, I added coming to America. We also have predator real genius, which I'm hoping if you want to vote good movie, Val Kilmer (laughs) and home alone, little Macaulay Culkin. I don't know. I don't know. After watching this, I could do another Christopher Columbus movie back to back. Uh, Predator has been on there like every week. So I, I keep putting choice. it back because I'm hoping. <laughs> Please get to the chopper. Please vote Predator. 
Please no, vote, vote Predator. At least you can't vote cocktail this weekend, this week, so I don't care what you do. We're going to win regardless, so just pick what you want. <laughs> All right, Gremlins, the 1984 movie, uh, was directed by Joe Dante, written by Christopher Columbus, and stars Zach Gilligan, Phoebe Cates, and Hoyt Axton. Steven Spielberg presents Gremlins. Billy Pelser has a nice home. Billy, is that you? Yeah, Ma, it's me. A nice job. A nice girl. If you're not doing anything this Thursday night, maybe you'd like to uh, go out on a date with me? I'd love to. And loving parents who are about to give him... You're going to like this. No, 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 don't shake it. We're going to have to open it now. It won't wait till Christmas. The most unusual gift <laughs> he ever got. What is it? No. It's your new pet. Come on, Barney, be a good dog. My dad gave it to me. But there are a few things to keep in mind. If you expose it to the light, you may hurt it. If you get it wet, it will multiply. All that from water? They got wet? Yeah, plain water. And most important, no matter how much they beg, never, never let them eat after midnight. Because when they do, they change. They become clever. Mischievous. Here. And dangerous. Gremlins, huh? Little monsters. Right. Hundreds of them. Well, I, I don't know, maybe thousands. They've been here too. Billy, what are these things? Where do they come from? Look, I know it sounds crazy, I know. But in a few hours, you're gonna have a major disaster on your hands. Gremlins. Directed by Joe Dante. They'll be expecting you. Gremlins alongside Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Those are the two movies that forced the MPAA to create PG-13. Well, I remember I, I remember it. You remember this? I, I remember it because it was the it was some of the violence. Like I remember it was Indiana Jones and the temple of doom, the whole Kalima with, with the whole ripping of the heart where they said, yeah. it's not, it's not really an R, but it's not PG. So that was what sure. forced them. And even in this one, this in, in gremlins, some of the stuff was, was too dark for PG. So I think it, it really needed to be created and it, it fits right in that in-between area. Yeah, it's funny now how it now set, the, this movie set the precedent for now what every new blockbuster sets forth to do, which is achieve that PG thirteen rating. Uh, Nineteen eighty four was an amazing movie or uh, movie year. I mean, just looking at this top list of grossing films, uh, Beverly Hills Cop was the top grossing film this year, followed by Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Then Gremlins was number four, Karate Kid number five, Police Academy. The original Police Academy coming at number six, followed by Footloose, Romancing the Stone, Star Trek Three, and Splash rounding out the top ten. But even if you keep hold on, going hold on, hold on, list, you got to keep going. You you got Revenge of the Nerds, you had Bachelor Party, Red Dawn, Terminator, uh, Friday the Thirteenth, the final chapter. You had Last Starfighter, Nightmare on Elm Street, and then Sixteen Candles. This entire top grossing movies of of eighty four. We could do the entire year's worth. All great yeah, movies. We, sh we should just retitle the podcast 1984 and just do nothing but 1984 movies. So Gremlins is about uh, a boy who inadvertently breaks three important rules concerning his new pet and unleashes a horde of mischievous monsters on a small town. You watched this movie back in 1984 when it first came out, yes? Oh, I watched it multiple times. I think I even saw it in the theaters. And, and I, I, yeah. I loved it then. I think I was a bit frightened. Because I still have some memories of some of the end dark scenes, like at the department store, that still frighten sure. me. And I feel like I'm a little kid. Right. I, I definitely vividly remember seeing this in the theater and then on VHS. Do you remember it? I do. I do remember seeing this. I think I saw it in the theaters. And I, I do remember being scared of it. And I do remember watching it. Because it also played in that era of HBO when we were growing up. They would play movies on back-to-back -back repeat constantly. And this was one of those movies that when it was 
released on HBO. It was just I all, always watched it, always watched it, always watched it. But it, it's weird looking back because I don't know how it got morphed or changed. But Christopher Columbus, I think this was a passion project for him, if my memory serves me correct. Didn't he wasn't he raised to believe that gremlins existed in walls and different things? And then that's where he wrote this whole script about it. Possibly it was. Was he Mr. Futterman? Was that the the, the character no, that's no. based on him? <laughs> but it's, was that Columbus's it's, father? You can tell at some point this movie was a lot darker than what it turned out to be. Oh, I, I think it's it's dark already. See, I had the benefit of watching this with my wife, who I could not believe had not seen it. I kept saying, "You sure you haven't seen this? You haven't seen it?" She said, "No." So as it's going on, she's she's watching in the beginning. She's like, Oh, this is so cute. Oh, look at look at Gizmo. Look at him. Then it slowly starts getting dark. And she's looking at me like, What what just happened to those things? Are those are they oh, oh, oh what kind of movie is this? And by the end, she was kind of tormented and like I had done the bait and switch. Like she didn't know what it was. And in the end, she ended up screaming a couple times, which which I found funny, but to see it through someone's eyes new, you, you realize it's scary. There's some scary parts to it. Uh, let me ask you this. Is it a scary comedy or is it a comedy that has scary parts? I think it's a comedy with scary parts, but then they weave in really dark kind of twisted characters and some lines that we'll get to that are right up there with some of the other movies that Kate later on, Phoebe, Phoebe Cates, character, Kate, says one of the darkest lines you you will ever hear in a holiday a movie, a Christmas movie, where we had to stop it and rewind it and say, did she really say that? So when we get to that, I'm going to go over it. But there's a couple lines and a couple stories that are, are not a holiday movie. There, See, this is where I feel this movie completely misses the mark in terms of its casting. Phoebe Cates, who you might remember from the bikini scene in Ridgemont high. She's the lead. She plays the character, Kate. She played the character, like a wholesome, you know, a small town girl that had maybe a little bit of weird backstory, but like she, that backstory didn't come out right away. And I feel like maybe if they had made her more of a darker character to the audience right away, instead of a bubbly, Oh, I I'm here to help save the bar. And I work here for free on the weekdays for, you know, just because I'm, you know, I'm nice. If they made her a little bit more dark and a little bit more silent and quiet and mysterious, kind of like uh, Winona Ryder's character in Beetlejuice, then I feel like I could have believed the words that came out of her mouth. What? So you wanted her to start off with people slitting their wrists on Christmas while other people are opening their gifts? No, you can't start out with that. No, no, you have to you have to get into that gradually. If she said that wanna, to, to Billy, he'd run. I want to believe it a little bit. I want to believe it a little bit. It, it's 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 crazy. I kept myself thinking throughout this entire watching experience. I was more scared of Phoebe Cates' character than I was of the actual Gremlins. I loved the Gremlins. I thought the Gremlins are great. Oh, I thought it held up real well. That's what I was surprised watching it is how good the visuals were besides right. a few some wide shots where they show all the gremlins together running that's really bad for a 1984 movie the special effects were spot on i thought it, it was it held up so well i was so happy overall i have a few major major plot problems with the whole yeah. m the mechanics of how the gremlins work and the environment they're in but I'm gonna I'm gonna look past that because overall I felt the 148 or whatever minutes it is just flew by. So uh, let's dive into this. So the movie starts off with a, a character, Rand Peltzer, who's the the father of Billy, and he starts off kind of it, it's weird. It's like it almost starts off like a weird noir private eye type film where he's narrating. Let me tell you a story. And he's got like that old timey PI voice. Did you get that same feeling? I got the feeling that that was added in at the end, that, that it was almost like the, the beginning didn't flow correct. So they needed the narrative to kind of tell people what was going on with that. And the closing narration, it didn't feel organic to me. It didn't feel like it was originally there. 
this is supposed to be Christmas time. He says Chinatown. Which Chinatown do you think he's in? Going off the weather, it has to be San Francisco. So you because, think he's a yeah, he's a traveling he's a salesman. He's out there. He's pushing the bathroom buddy. He's got to sell okay. it. You, you got to pay the rent. He's struggling. I, if I saw that white man in Chinatown, I would think he was looking for herbal Viagra or ground up rhino horn or, or that, that little, the, 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 the grandson to do something. I, I wouldn't think he's there looking for a unique gift for his son. The, I believe the exact line, he's there to move merchandise. I was like, what merchandise are you moving, sir? And why are you following little kids into, a, you know, a basement in Chinatown in a scummy area? Uh, I, I thought he was in New York because the town, I guess that they go back to where they actually live. It felt like upstate New York. So he didn't seem like a very successful sales guy or inventor, which he made it seem like, why, why would he, he didn't be seem? He didn't seem no, there was nothing successful about him. No. See, and I thought at first it was New York because the the little the little Chinese grandson with the Yankees hat. But right. uh, but looking at it, the weather, they were dressed. It was warm. It was California. But uh, I'm just shocked. Did you notice he was the, the little grandson was was a, a doppelganger for short round from Temple of Doom? Yeah. Little yeah. Asian boy, same outfit, Yankees cap. And it came out the exact same time. So it couldn't have been copied. But I just didn't know what Short Round was doing in Chinatown, pushing merchandise. Hold on. Let's talk about this. Because the same three executive producers that produced Gremlins also produced Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which came out the same year. And this entire movie, throughout the entire movie, it, I don't know if it's satire, but it seems as if Steven Spielberg is just kind of blowing himself throughout the entire movie. Because there's Easter eggs, like blatant Easter eggs, back to steven spielberg films so so maybe besides having a thing for young asian boys he likes promoting his old movies from the marquee in the in the town's uh you know theater that's actually the was the working title for et i think it was a boy's life or the et doll or or gizmo saying phone home or he does he does seem to like to toot his own horn anyway he goes downstairs to this mysterious ancient Chinese store. He's trying to sell his bathroom buddy. Now, should we talk about what the exact, what, what the bathroom buddy is? Where are you going to carry that thing? It's not going to fit in your pocket. You need like a man purse. That thing was ridiculous. It was terrible. And then you don't even want to ever say bathroom buddy out loud. Oh, I got to go home and get my bathroom buddy. You don't, don't say that product name is terrible. Product was terrible. And I can't, I can picture that you would want one, especially as a young child. Uh, but anyway, he hears singing in the background. Uh, he finds Gizmo. This I didn't understand. He says, I'm looking for a present for my son for Christmas. This is exactly what I'm looking for. When we go back to the hometown, we discover that Billy has a very loyal like dog who's who goes to work with him. Why does he need another pet? Uh, I have a better question. Why do you keep Gizmo locked in a box? If he is like a family member, he's your pet. He's not going anywhere. He's not going to eat. He's not going to get wet. He's... You keep them locked in the box with a, with a sheet over it. I think that's torture. I feel bad for Gizmo. I am glad he got out. The little grandson was trying to liberate. It was free willy with Gizmo. Yeah, grandson hustles it out for uh, a cool $200. And uh, then we're transported into, I totally called it from the, from the get-go. I was like, this is the set of Back to the Future, which it, which it is. All the buildings are the same. All the, all the businesses are the, the same. Except for the the very blatant product placement by Burger King. But what I don't get about this is that Burger King is the only business that you see. But they actually did a promotion for the movie with Hardee's, where Hardee's did a series of Gremlins story records that they did each week for five weeks with the movie's release. So I don't know why the hell they had Burger King in there, but then Hardee's was doing the promotion. But you, you've glossed over. You, you went past one of the biggest problems with the movie, the, the, the rules. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. The Mogwai rules. What so, are the, they? so the grandson says, he says, first off, you got to keep him out of the light. He hates bright lights, especially sunlight. He said sunlight can kill him. Second, he said, you know, don't give him water, not even to drink. But the most important rule, this is the most important rule that you never forget is no matter how much he cries or begs, don't feed him. 
the the fact that he thinks the rule about feeding him is 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 worse than him dying from sunlight is kind of messed up. Yeah. But it takes the father about five minutes at home to just forget every rule, break every rule, and just put everyone's lives at risk. I have serious serious issues with these rules and i need someone to, to explain them to me number one no sunlight it'll kill them fantastic but why are they averse to bright like everything is like bright light to them bright light forgetting the fact that how do these guys know english so well they're raised by an asian store person i don't know how does he know english so well oh anyway. you better you better tread lightly you're going into yeah. a dangerous place <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna secondly, have to cut this whole thing right, we're gonna no, have to cut this no. whole thing secondly don't get them wet don't even give them water how does it fucking survive if you can't feed it water to drink what does it drink you're, you're looking too far into this it's a gremlin no, in a box in chinatown no no it's like a little furry pet that yeah, i want to take home secondly never feed it after midnight is there a time zone requirement are gremlins on certain time zones? Which time zone do they do they abide by? It doesn't make any sense. Are there hours between midnight and 6 a.m. when I can't feed them, but then I can feed them after 6 a.m.? Everything is after midnight. It made no sense to me. I didn't get it. That's why you won't get a mogwai. I have you just, serious questions. You're the kid who asks movie. so many questions. Just get the mogwai and have fun with it. Follow the rules. You're the one who wants to know every single rule and kill the fun. I like, listen, if I'm going to suspend disbelief for the next 147 minutes, I want to understand what I'm not supposed to do and then what will happen if it does. <laughs> it seems as if water, the only thing that water does is it creates more mogwai. So that's how they reproduce, right? Yes. Okay, what's so wrong with that? When you just give a little bit of water, they just shoot out new mogwais. And now we got more mogwais. It's painful. Do you see poor Gizmo? It's not a fun thing for him. He looks like you stuck him on a frying pan. He's rolling around. He's bubbling. He's sizzling. You feel bad for him. It's torture besides creating new mogwais. Why don't you ask your wife if she enjoyed childbirth, okay? Oh, you should have seen her face when she gets when he gets wet. She's like, oh, my goodness. Oh, what's happening to him? Is he burning? Get a towel. <laughs> it was too funny. And I had to sit there and say, no, just wait. Just wait. He's not hurt. He's OK. Let's talk about water creates new gremlins. Yes. New new mogwai. That's correct. Gremlin is when they turn into the, the green guys. Right. But For the purposes of this discussion. That's correct. But But they replicate also with water new mogwai are good there's nothing wrong with that but you feed them after midnight that's mm. when they go into no i have a theory I have a, I have a theory about okay. this all right uh, i think all mogwai seem to be pretty nice except for stripe stripe had some issues i think they became that way because of the environment they were put into the the actual mogwai that ends up with the science teacher his name is earl just in case you wanted to know and if you were put in a cage at birth and you had some scientist sticking you with a syringe and putting you in a tiny cage in the corner, you'd be pissed off, too. You'd probably turn bad. Billy's okay. got these five mogwai stuck in a box. I don't think they'd be happy either. They'd want to get out. You'd want to be free. So I think mogwais are inherently good, but the conditions they were under caused them to become bad. So we're introduced to all these characters. Billy is the main protagonist. He ends up walking to work with his dog where he works at the bank. My question to you, how old is Billy? Well, I have no idea of how old he is. He, he lives at home with his parents, right? Well, he's we, old enough to drive and, and have a car, but he's well, not in school. Gerald Hopkins, who is Judge Reinhold, is the dickhead you know, assistant manager or whatever he is. He says he's 23, and he seems like he's a peer of Billy. So I'm thinking they're both 22, 23. He's struggling. So Billy is 23, living at home, supporting his family by working at the bank. That's correct. You know, Billy's down because he's gonna, he might lose his job because the dog attacked you know, Mrs. Deagle. So they go over to the bar. Billy just wants to have a drink, hang out with Kate. And in comes Gerald, you know, the, the young assistant vice, whatever he is at the bank. Okay. And he tries to pick up Kate. Right in front of Billy. Do you remember what his line was? How he was going to try to get in Kate's pants? 
<laughs> it was something about going back to his apartment because he has cable. Yes, yes. He said exactly. He said, you got to come back to my place. I got cable. Did that work? I think in 1980, I think in 1984, if you had cable, it was a sign that you were doing well in life. This was this was Netflix and chill. That's exactly it was created right here. This is That's cable exactly. and chill. So they head home now. You know, Billy walks home and he's there and in comes dad from his business trip. So whether he was in California or New York, doesn't matter. The father comes in, and says, hey, I got a gift for you. And over the course of the next six minutes, they violate every single rule multiple times. Are they making a statement here so about how stupid middle American white families are that they can't follow three simple rules? So there is a line at the end of the movie that sums up what I felt Christopher Columbus or the director Joe Dante was trying to get across. Did you catch that at the end? Yeah, it, it's where the, the grandfather comes in and the grandfather makes a comment. He says, uh, yeah, I think his name was Mr. Wing, the grandfather. He says, he says, you deal with the Mogwai just like your your society deals with all nature's gifts. You don't understand so, it and you're not ready. So you're what telling are, me an entire, an entire movie of uh, cartoon-like gremlins is an analogy for the way that the Western world is destroying the Eastern world's way of life. Like Western society takes everything in ruins because we, we, we destroy the balance of nature. Is that it? I think he's saying that the white man is destroying nature. <laughs> Mr. Wing, is, yes. he, he's making a comment and I don't blame him. He tells this man three rules. He can't follow those three simple rules. How should he expect him to protect the environment recycle clean energy he can't even just turn the lights off don't get the damn pet wet and don't feed it you know clean energy is way above his head so gizmo apparently seems to be the uh perfect pet it's hanging out with uh the dog and with billy up in the room he's playing a little tune on the piano things are going pretty well right well in walks and this is my problem that i have with the movie a 23-year-old man is best friends with a middle schooler? How is no one raising red flags here? Well, this is pre-Jared from Subway. So back then, I think he, I was friends. We had an adult neighbor when I was growing up. And he, I mean, he was adult. I, I was probably 12, 13. He was in his mid-30s. But he had every single video game system in his basement. And and me and a few other kids in the neighborhood would always go down there for hours and play video games. He never did anything. You know, he was a he was cool to hang out with as a kid. But now I don't know what were my parents thinking, letting me go down into this dude's basement. That's how every like horror movie starts now. You would never let that Agreed. happen. But I think back then, if if Corey uh, Corey Feldman wanted to hang out up in a twenty three year old man's room, I think you it, it'd be okay back in eighty four. Anyway, dumb Pete, Corey Feldman, comes in, immediately pours water on Gizmo, and, and hatches the, the other Mogwais. You, you don't think he, he's sitting on the bed with a glass of water. You, Billy can't even follow the rules for 10 minutes. Tell him, say, hey, Pete, get off the damn bed. You can't get this thing wet. And how the hell is, is this young kid, you know, Pete, more interested in a comic book than some animal he has never seen before? He's looking with his little 3D glasses at a comic book. I'd be like, what the hell is that little... If somebody brought to me like Grover from Sesame Street and it was alive, I would be like, holy shit, what is that thing? I want to I wanna go play with that thing. I'm not going to get distracted. And I didn't buy that Pete just was like, oh, look, it's a new living doll, whatever, I'm done. Pete is the villain of this movie. No, he's not. Billy's a dick. If your buddy had a gizmo, right? He had a, he had a mogwai. You saw it get wet. He now has six and he won't give you one. Are you still going to be his friend? Yeah, I, I don't understand that. They're like, what are we going to do with them? Why does the dad automatically assume? Well, now I can sell him as Peltzer pets. Oh, he's a terrible the person. He is, be- he is all about exotic animal trafficking. Maybe he was in Chinatown looking for rhino horn because he immediately is talking about breeding this animal and selling it to kids he is in he just wants a wild animal he wants to traffic he does not give a shit so billy now has six little mogwai what would you do if you had six little mogwai that if you poured water on one would reproduce 
would you take that to a, a, I don't know, maybe a veterinarian? Obviously, you probably have one because you have a dog. Would you, or would you take it to a middle school science teacher? What, what would you do? I would not have taken it to that creepy ass science teacher. I don't know any science teacher that has like syringes. And like he's doing autopsies on animals. I don't know what he's doing. And also, he brings it to him at like almost like eleven thirty at night. What yeah. the hell is he doing at school at that time? And why would you give away one of your pets? And he says, "I'm going to run some tests, some experiments on it." Mister Hansen has some weird hours. Not only is he seeing people at, after hours at school, which I don't even think is. I think it's against the law for you to be on school grounds past a certain hour. But the, there's some point in the movie where he is in the lab until 2.15 in the morning and just nonchalantly says, well, time to call it a night. I, I'm very creeped out by Mr. Hansen. And the way he's talking to that poor gremlin where he's like, oh, this isn't going to hurt you too bad. Just come here. And just like jabs him in the hand with the syringe. And again, that gremlin's name was Earl. And you can see... That's where Earl turns bad. Earl was nice prior to that. Do they trick Billy into feeding them after midnight? Did you get that? Like, they, they set him up, right? Yeah, w- without a doubt. It's obvious that they have talked about it. The, the the five gremlins, I think, at that point, there might be four in the box, that have planned to eat the cord so they can trick Billy into feeding them past midnight. Billy looks at the clock. He sees that it's 1130. They got time. He goes down and gets food. Not only does he feed him, but then he falls asleep. Would you fall asleep a half an hour before midnight that you think it is with a plate of food and chicken bones next to the animal that you're not supposed to feed after midnight? The proper exotic animal care is not being followed whatsoever. Not only that, but why just plates of what appear to be baked chicken? The way that they devour those that, that raw meat and those bones, I would be afraid to sleep in a room with five of those. You don't know if they're going to get up and come and start chewing on you. They might eat Buddy that you don't know what they're going to do. There's no way when I saw them kill that raw meat that I'm I'm not putting them into a cage. They feed them. They go to a pupil stage where they're like in little cocoons. Uh, and no one seems to be worried that this is happening. These things are straight out of the movie Alien. They look gross. They look disgusting. I would worry about that it was some kind of virus or you would get sick. I wouldn't think yeah. about the, that there there are animals in there. You would worry that you have some kind of infestation or there's some kind of virus or you know some kind of uh, bacteria that killed these poor little animals. That house would be quarantined. You'd call the police. You'd call the CDC. You would get people in there in hazmat suits. So he wakes up the next morning and is not at all concerned about these five pussy, green, oozing, eggs that are on the floor of his bedroom would you have had an issue with this what would you have done i would immediately have like number one freaked out number two been like what's going on gizmo obviously you know what this is you can talk english explain to me what just happened he can talk english you can can... (laughs) so you want him to describe what happened to these five animals with yum 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 i don't have yum yum (laughs) Say bright lights. No bright lights. Bright, no bright lights. lights. Okay, so whatever. So so Gizmo pipes down. He doesn't say a word. And Billy Lee. Gizmo's no snitch. That's why. <laughs> oh, Gizmo's no snitch. No, Gizmo knows. Snitches get stitches. He knows what's happened. So did you know that the original script called for Gizmo to turn and be the evil one? Uh, I did. The original, the original script, uh, Gizmo was supposed to eat the chicken and turn bad. And that w- and I feel like that would have been a better movie. I mean, I enjoy Gizmo, the cuteness of it, but I feel from a movie perspective, it would have been better had he turned due to the negligence of his white Caucasian 23-year-old loser uh, and his terrible family just chilling in the house. I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> no, I was okay with it. I was okay with it. The whole family, this could not happen in a family that is organized, productive, that is is uh, you know, a healthy environment. You need dad to be absent. You need mom to be kind of ditzy. You need the son to not really pay attention. And that you need that perfect storm and dad dealing in illegal imported wild animals. 
uh, to have the, this happen because nowhere else would a, a 23 year old man leave these infectious pods in his house. He leaves his poor mother there who's sitting downstairs making cookies. But this is when she turns into bad ass. And this is, I, I really, I gotta tell you, I, I liked her. She defended herself well, but this is one of the creepier scenes ever. She's cooking. She goes up and sees the pod, and then she hears the wonderful tunes of Johnny Mathis singing, Do You Hear What I Hear? on the record player downstairs. All right. So what you're talking about here is the pods start breaking open. She hears a rustling upstairs. She immediately goes for the knife. Now, did that make sense to you? you I think she's had to defend herself before. Uh, maybe dad's had a couple drinks. He didn't sell any uh, bathroom buddies. He comes home liquored up and angry. Once she's upstairs, she sees that they've broken open and they're scurrying about. She comes downstairs to Johnny Mathis. I'm out. If I hear that Johnny Mathis song, even today, I, I the hairs on my on my neck stand up. They start. She spots one in the kitchen. Bam. She didn't even question. Like she had seen these animals fluffy and friendly she doesn't even wonder if they're still nice she goes over to the one that's eating the cookie bam gets it in the blender it's dead number two she goes over she gets it with a knife and just butchers it she then sprays the third one with flea and tick killer and and knocks it in the microwave which it then explodes she's now got gremlin goo all over she finally gets in a fight with the fourth one Billy comes in with the sword, hacks it up. It goes in the fireplace. Not once did she try to ask if these gremlins were still nice. She could have killed four really friendly gremlins who had just had a terrible accident and just looked different. I completely agree. This was the part of the movie where I was like, it makes no sense that all of a sudden she wants to kill these creatures just because they look like little scaly lizards. They could have been in there just like enjoying some cookies and gallivanting through the kitchen because they're little young little puppies. You know, if, if I had, uh, if I, if we, you and I went around killing dogs every time they, they chewed up our shoe, we'd be put in jail. God forbid that Buddy gets mange. His ass might end up in the dryer or the washing machine or the microwave, too. Again, the original script for the movie called for Billy's mom to die. During that whole scene, the original yeah, scene called for, they were going to cut her head off. They were going to kill and, the dog and throw him down the stairs. I'm okay with them killing the mom. I'm not okay with them killing the dog. I think it would have been a cool scene to see though, with her uh, with the gremlins decapitating the head and then just rolling it down the stairs. Or better, put the head in the laundry chute that goes down into the. La- Did you have one of those? Laundry shoots in your house, or is that like an invention by Peltzer? Is that another Peltzer invention? Well, I, I all I know is that Kevin he needed that to survive in Home Alone, so maybe that is a thing in the Midwest. I did not have one of those in my house, but it, it's obviously a thing. The laundry chute or the laundry. dumb waiter, whatever it is. Yeah. But have we talked about why Billy's concerned? Have we talked about the fact that he finds Mister Hanston dead in the school? Killed by Earl the Gr- Earl the Gremlin? Well, I don't know that I would automatically suspect that it was the Gremlin. This could have been some gang violence. He just finds the, the teacher under like the, 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 the table with a syringe in his butt. That could have been a lot of things. Yeah. That could have been yeah. Mr. Hansen could have been just hopped up on drugs. He could have hang- been like a pusher. He's but, hanging out in the school at the midnight and at 2 a.m with syringes god only knows what he's up to this could have been a million things and a gremlin was only one of them but either way i'm not hanging out in there he's walking around looking i'm gone yeah i would not want to but he but he finds the gremlin he finds earl and he kills earl how does he kill earl he doesn't kill earl earl gets out earl gets out earl escapes earl is one of the the gremlins that last the longest. Oh, yes. okay. All right. Yeah, no, Earl escapes through the vent. So I think you're right, actually. And this is the thing that bothered me about this is I thought to myself, there wasn't there another gremlin that did escape, and it actually was the one from the school. It 
does he turn up anywhere else in any of the fight scenes? I think he's in the movie theater with everybody else, but we don't specifically see Earl again until the very end. All right, so they leave the house, and you see the gremlins start to all come in. This is the one part where maybe some CGI would have been better because they were still using some old-school stop motion. Oh, this was bad stop motion. You you could see there were too many characters, so it looked like just the – you remember that old football game where you'd put the players on and it would vibrate? And the players would just move around. That's what it looked like. It looked like they had a vibrating table with little gremlin dolls, and they just kind of shuffled around. But it was the only bad, bad special effects in the whole movie, but it was awful. The suspension of disbelief in terms of whether or not I believe that these little these little things that were existed or or had some sort of weight or movement, that was the one thing that lost it for me. But up until that point, I was thinking to myself, the – it, it still holds up. I, in fact, I like the puppetry better than any kind of crappy CGI that, you know, if it's made today, would probably exist. I think the special effects were good. But can we talk about here the gremlins? Like, they go from these wild kind of demon creatures to all caricatures. We start seeing them hiding in mailboxes. We start seeing them playing jazz with little puppets. We see them go and get Christmas caroling outfits, let alone organize and start singing in front of people's houses. Like, weren't they just going to go start tearing shit up? But I liked it. It was, it was kind of cute. They went a little over the top, uh, getting puppets on, playing jazz doing flash dance, playing cards Uh, of that. Oh, there was also a mugger, a mugger gremlin with a gun of that whole crazy cast. Did you have one that you really liked? Um, The puppeteer that is, I don't know. Is he hanging out with a gremlin that's supposed to be Frank Sinatra at a table and he's giving him like a little puppet show. And then the Frank Sinatra gremlin like punches him. Yes. No, no. He hits him over the head with like a hammer or something. But you can yeah. see that he's looking at the gremlin. The gremlin keeps and he lets it go just <laughs> long enough that I'm like, man, this can't go on anymore. He pushes it. It was awesome. And there's a whole well, flash dad montage in there. I, I like the um, bowling on the bar with the bottles. Let's talk about that bar scene. So Kate is at the bar with serving gremlins. I, how does this happen? How does she not immediately just run away when the gremlins uh, approach the bar or, or get into the bar? Is she trapped behind the bar? I didn't get this. I didn't understand this. Well, I think the bar is owned by her father. And that's why they joke about her early on not collecting like a paycheck or not making money. I think it's a family relative or her father. And I think that's the only reason that she stays there is that she feels bad for him and is somewhat trying to protect him and the bar. But she's not doing any good. During this entire bar scene, they're all wearing little hats and little jackets and little shirts and holding little mugs. And they're singing Irish drinking songs. Where did they get all this stuff for this scene? Not only that, but then they find little little guns and little knives. I, I you know, this like this is the part of the movie that, that I didn't question as a child, but now I question as an adult. You know how you go to a wedding these days and everybody has the photo booth set up with all the props, like the little signs, the hats, the funny sunglasses, uh, all the boas. I felt like there must have been something there around. The gremlins came in and there was all their props just ready. But I loved it. But this gets me back to my flaw in the major theme of the movie. So we we know the rules. You don't get them wet. Sunlight kills them. You don't feed them after midnight. All of these gremlins are drinking. They're all pounding beers. They're all drinking liquor. How are they not multiplying by the hundreds in this bar? Does alcohol counteract the properties of water so that they don't continually reproduce no there's no way that happens you know how much water they were drinking like Michelob high life yeah there's tons of water in that garbage this wasn't some micro brew they were drinking like 80 percent water they should have been replicating left and right i think the whole transformation of the gremlins to little mischievous puppets that they can sell at toy stores was a second script treatment by kathleen kennedy steven spielberg and frank marshall i think that the original 
gremlins were more like the critters in the movie critters where they were like evil bastards uh who were going around terrorizing killing an entire town not these cute little uh lizard-like creatures that took on personalities of humans and you know flashed kate behind the bar for comedic laughs there's no way this this existed in the original script I felt like they probably shot it without these and it was just too kind of dark and evil that if you just had all these gremlins kind of just in naked, not in costume, not singing carols, that it would be, if you just saw them ripping people apart, making cars crash explosions, it's too dark. You needed some comedy. So I think they all sat around, smoked a ton of weed and said, okay, what would be funny for gremlins to do? Oh, we got him Christmas Carol. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, let's uh let's have other ones dressed in a ski mask. Yeah, that's a good one. I think they were just finding anything that would make it a little less evil and kind of bring some humor back in because it it would have turned dark real quick. I want to know how gremlins understand the mechanics behind how to cut brakes on a police cruiser <laughs> or operate this... the the traffic lights. I want to no, know made... how how you go from little egg to lizard humanoid creature in 30 minutes and come out understanding um advanced machinery this made me feel bad for them these weren't i'm okay throwing one of these gremlins into a microwave when it's just a monster trying to kill my mother but when they're out there they're in character they're playing they're having a good time they're laughing they're enjoying it to me you're murdering living Sentient beings who have a personality and a life. I would not. Now, after, how do you kill little flash dance gremlin or poker playing gremlin? You can't kill those. Those are little beings with personalities and souls. I dare say they had souls. This is the ultimate goal of the gremlins. Is it just to cause mischief and have a good time? Because we don't really, we don't really get to understand whether or not the gremlins want to kill people or they just want to create havoc and have a good time. We're we're not introduced to that even when Billy's mother well, comes that's a, down. That's a good question. Do they actually kill anyone other than the I don't the, the think that they do. They usually set up a I don't situation think they, for people to die. But I don't think they actually other than Stripe trying to kill Billy that they actually, you know, directly kill anybody. No, I think that they I think the Gremlins are misunderstood creatures. If Peter was around in 1984, they would have protested this movie. Maybe this is like I Am Legend. Like, I'm not sure if you read the book, where it, it's the last human that survives, and this virus has created a, a vampire-like society. And in this society, he, Robert Neville, becomes the, the human version of the, of the vampire. He's the, he's the one who comes out and the kids are afraid of. I'd like to see this movie told by the gremlins. You know, they're just out there having a good time. They just want to party. And here comes Billy burning them, shooting them, throwing them in the microwave. I feel bad for the gremlins now, actually. I actually think the gremlins were the heroes of this movie. The gremlins are completely misunderstood creatures that have a soft spot for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and old school movie theaters and, you know, just uh, getting drunk and singing carols and. You know, they, they probably really like Santa Claus. That's why they were all over that one poor Santa Claus that came out of his house. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure running away. That, half of, that half of our listeners would love to sit home, get drunk, and throw on a movie. To me, it sounds like half here's the how, I know. Here's how I know the gremlins were good and the, and the good guys. When they went to Mrs. Deagle's house and tormented her and set up her little uh, wheelchair stair thingy for her to like get tossed outside the house. I was rooting for that. I, I totally agree. So I, I'm thinking the gremlins are good here. So the gremlins now all decide they're going to go watch a movie. So they all pack into the movie theater. And I was shocked when, when they said snow white on the marquee, how the hell did Disney. Okay. An entire theater full of gremlins who had just, you know, torch this entire town. How did they okay their movie to be shown? Um, I think that probably the one condition is, hey, put some Mickey ears on the Gremlins. This is Disney in the 80s. Disney in the 80s, you know, they they had kind of lost their way 
Uh, they hadn't produced a good movie since The Jungle Book. So they were just jonesing for any kind of attention. I mean, back in the 80s, Disney World and the Magic Kingdom was falling apart. They weren't making any money. So I'm sure they just said, yeah, pay us anything. We'll, you can show our movie. We, we just need some money. Yeah, they must have seen that Spielberg had just done E.T. They said, man, just get us in one of his movies. He'll help us out. But yeah. so, so now we see all the gremlins in the movie theater having a good time. Uh, Kate and Billy start to have a conversation. And this is where Kate just lays it out. Kate gets real dark. Kate decides to tell Billy why she doesn't like Christmas. And she tells a story about being nine and that her dad disappears on Christmas Eve. You know, they, they don't know where he is. And it takes them four to five days to then one start a fire in the fireplace to realize that their dad has been stuck in the chimney for four days. Do you think it would take four days before you smelled your father stuck and rotting in your chimney? It's not only that. She says we didn't smell him until we lit the fire. So she lit a fire because she said it was cold. Then they started smelling. She literally roasted her dead father's body. Oh, that, that would have smelled really good. And then yeah. w- what father thinks he's going to fit down a chimney? This was obviously pre-supersized America because there's, what, 10% of fathers today that could fit down a chimney? <laughs> what was he thinking? At what point in a conversation, if a girl were to say this to you, a girl that you liked, and she were to bust out a story like that, how much of your mind it starts to think, well, what percentage of damaged is she to what you can tolerate what like how crazy is it for you to like how crazy does a girl have to be before you just cut it loose well i'm gonna balance it out she looks like phoebe cates she bit crazy i i I think i'd I'd be willing to give it a chance really Until she started cutting or until she started watching me sleep she seems sweet she's twisted but uh, she seems pretty cool, and she's hot, so I think I could tolerate it. You wouldn't tolerate she, it? No, because this is how crazy this this woman is, the, this, her, the Kate character. Not only does she have a, like a sort of dark, eerie past, but she also doesn't blink twice in terms of serving drinks to underage gremlins. These gremlins were born that day. She just, ah, fuck it. Never mind. That's a terrible <laughs> joke. Okay, I can't for you. Not only is she serving gremlins, but she's also a terrible bartender. She was going to let a very highly intoxicated man, Mr. Futterman, drive his bulldozer home. Oh, she's a garbage bartender. She can't even keep up. They're drinking bottled beer and straight liquor. How does she get in the weeds? How does that happen? She's a terrible bartender. Terrible bartender. Uh, So Billy, Kate, uh, go to the movie theater where the gremlins are watching. And they decide we have to blow up the movie theater. My question to you, why are all the gremlins at the movie theater? How have they reconvened? Was there some sort of gremlin signal that was sent out to to convene? This leads us back to my thought that the gremlins aren't all evil. They could have continued wreaking mayhem and starting to reproduce. But instead, they're going to take a break. They want to watch a movie. And... Also, besides drinking, which would have caused them to replicate, they're walking around in the snow. It is snowing. The snow will yeah. melt on them. They're getting wet. At this point, there should be 10,000 gremlins. Minimum. How did they not So wait a minute. You have shat all over my beliefs in staying within the rule system. Damn Hold it. on. Just listen. There is a big difference between you being upset about the time zone in which they eat or me being upset that they're getting wet the entire time. This isn't it's a the minor same rule. thing. No, right. it's not the same thing. Let, let me ask you this. Is this are these the gremlins? Is this their final form? I, I think this is it because we don't there, have a fourth it, rule. There's nothing like eating carbs after eight o'clock or gluten will cause them to do something. This is it. This is their final well, let, form. So go with me on my logic here. Mogwais look like Gizmo, the cute little furry creature that sings and just wants to have fun, right? And learns English ridiculously fast. They reproduce by getting wet. If I drop some water on Gizmo, another Gizmo Mogwai comes up. 
But if that Mogwai eats after midnight, they turn into lizard gremlins. With me so far? I'm with you. Now, that lizard gremlin, if he jumps into pool, does he produce more lizard gremlins or does he produce Mogwais? What movie are you watching? Stripe is a lizard gremlin. He jumps in the pool and makes a couple hundred lizard gremlins. Do we know that for sure? <laughs> where, where do you think they all came out as mogwais and then they all decided to eat past midnight? Yes. No, of course they came out as lizards. Okay. All right. So there's nothing else that happens to these gremlins after if they lizard form eats after midnight, nothing happens to them. No, but I, I think I've just picked up on another trend. We were talking about how Mr. Wong is kind of talking down to Western society. Maybe if they eat after midnight, they turn into these uh, little, little monsters. Was a, a subtle comment about America's oncoming uh, fight with obesity that they were telling Americans that they should not be eating after midnight or you become this horrible, like monstrous incarnation. We should have listened. So they're all in the theater. Billy's knowledge of gas lines and which valve to turn on and off uh, uh, really surprised me uh, how accurate he was. And they were seemingly blow up all the gremlins. But Spike, due to his uh, little bit of uh, got a sweet tooth, he escapes uh, and goes to uh, Montgomery Ward while all of this is happening. Uh, so he he survives. So he's a lone lizard survivor. Yeah, he goes next door to the uh, department store. To, to get some candy because they were out in the theater. And luckily he survives the blast. We, we presumably every other gremlin is killed and stripe is the last one. If that's the right. case, Billy is a, a, a terrorist or his play. Like he was good. Like there was no, no, you could put a team of, uh, of seals in there and they would have struggled to kill <laughs> all those gremlins with a lighter and like a, a pipe wrench. But Billy managed to do it. One of the scenes that terrorized me as a child and still terrorizes me today, the entire scene in the dark uh, department store, uh, what were your thoughts on it? My thoughts are how hard is it to turn on lights in a department store? It shouldn't be this hard. That was Yeah, Kate's useless in this. She, she sure can turn on all of the department notifications and music, but she has a hard time turning on any of the lights which we know gremlins hate lights. That would be beneficial. But did they sell loaded handguns in department stores in the 80s? There was a ton of ammunition seemingly around every corner. Not only different types of ammunition, but little baby gremlin-sized ammunition. Uh, 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 apparently, these were kid-sized. <laughs> I guess the NRA, NRA was always uh, powerful. But th this the scene where... He is there. He's got Billy on the ground and he's firing somehow baseballs out of a tennis ball serving machine. Again, I'll let it go. He's got Billy on the ground. He's got him with the chainsaw. And this is terrifying. At this point, my wife was watching and she's looking at me being like, this is PG 13. It was frightening. I can't imagine any worse weapon than someone coming at me with a chainsaw. Here's here's my problem with this entire final act in the movie. Billy is the worst fighter known to movie cinematic history. He is trying to block Insaw with a wooden bat. How does this make sense? How does the chainsaw not go through that Louisville slugger right away? No, he's not even trying Manny, to defend himself. He's only trying. It's, it's, no. chew it's chewing up the bat. So he knows he only has about 20 seconds. He is not making any attempt to kind of swat at him. He's just sitting there just waiting ah, for doom. He's, ah, I can't wait to. Like, oh, God, Billy's such a pussy. I like, just wish that, Billy's right, mother how was tall, there. Apparently, it skips the generation. So how tall are these gremlins? They're maybe, what, two feet high? There's no establishment of whether or not these gremlins have super strength or anything like that, he should have been able to overpower and just kick this gremlin, you know, up, up against the wall it, easily. I, I'm imagining that gremlins are, are the equivalent of a small child. So I would like to think if I was attacked by, I think I could probably take, I'm a bigger dude. I think I could take on at least 20 children, 20 small children where you could pick one up by the feet and start swinging it around and hitting the other ones. So yeah, 
I don't know why Billy, who is a 23 year old man, will struggle to beat this one child. Essentially, his mother exact killed four of them almost single handedly. So my other problem with the final act in this scene is the fact that Gizmo is driving around in a Barbie car for no other reason other than to sell more toys. Like there didn't need to be the Gizmo in a Barbie car looking all cute and everything like that. He doesn't really do anything, I guess. Well, God, we we needed a way. We we need we we needed a way for him to get around. So the Barbie car was cute. It did the call back to the earlier scene where he was watching the race car movie. Which ah, was o- that's obvious. what it was. Yeah, it was foreshadowing. You could see when he was watching the race car and he was kind of dreaming it up that later on they, they would tie it in. But so little- here, here's my problem with the way that the final scene happens. So Kate has turned on in her quest to turn on all the lights has turned on the working water fountain. How disappointed were you when you walked into a Montgomery ward and Montgomery ward looked nothing like this or had any of the things that you saw in gremlins. Oh, this reminds me this, this looked like some of the department stores I can remember. So I, I actually think I remember some with fountains that may have been selling like fishing gear nearby and stuff. So it felt pretty genuine to me other than the handguns. And all the top of the line electronics it seemed pretty, pretty uh, reminiscent of my childhood. So you had your department stores had pitching machines. They had none of this in Florida. None. Of course, Florida is kind of a backward state. So that makes Ooh, sense. Be, be very careful. So Gizmo saves the day uh, as Stripe is about to jump into the fountain, replicate more gremlins. He jumps to the Barbie car and pulls down the shades, illuminating the area and killing Spike. Was it daylight? Where is this light coming from? Yeah, it was daylight. Once, they've been they've been fighting throughout the night. How is it daylight? Because once the fight is over, it's night again. <laughs> you, you know, it's not. When they go outside, the cops, you can see that it's dawn. All no, the police are outside. Dawn. It is not dawn. It is night still. There's a there is a very real continuity error. I think they so the reports are that they had to rush they had to rush this movie. This movie was originally intended to be a fall winter release. They pushed it up to be a summer release. I think that they totally screwed the pooch, rushed the scenes, didn't care about continuity, and the whole movie is a mess. Oh, you're you're completely changing your tune. I'm going the other way. Okay, it's daylight enough. The sun comes in. He now turns stripe. Daylight enough? That doesn't make any sense. Daylight they, enough. They said sunlight kills him. They didn't quantify it. They didn't say you have just to Just a little bit. A, just a little bit. Just a little bit oh, of sun. So, so just a little bit of day. There's, oh, God, this movie is terrible. The rules Shut don't make up. sense. Yeah, so needless to, to say, he now turns into that pussy kind of mush as the sun burns him. I was blown away at how good it looked. I thought the special effects as he's melting were, they could pass today, I think, as, as, as what Hollywood could turn out. Did you have a problem with that? No, that looked good. It reminded me of the final uh, death scene of the Nazi in uh, The Last Crusade, Indiana Jones' Last Crusade. Again, oh, I, I, I disagree. Think, I think this stole. looked much better. You think it looked better? This looked much oh, okay. better than the melting wax head Nazi. I, all right, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. And it was a little scary when it does the jump scare again at the end uh, to you know give you a final little jump in your seat. So, yeah, I like that. Well, well here's a question for you. Is Billy or his dad at all uh, criminally or any kind of, you know, whether civil suits, are they liable for anything that they've done, the damage they've caused, and the murders that they've been complicit in? They have to be because the, they try and cover up all the stuff that happened uh, through a news report on the on a background television saying that this was all mass hysteria. Mass hysteria caused these issues. So there's no verifiable proof. It seems as if the town is trying to sweep under the rug that these things ever existed. Therefore they have to legally go after Billy and his family and uh, all his accomplices uh, for civil damages that resu- resulted as a, uh, as a, 
resulted you're as struggling. a <laughs> you're, you're you're good. <laughs> I got I get where you're trying to go. <laughs> so yes, are the they answer is yes. The answer is yes. yes. I can I can foresee an entire string of lawsuits where people are you if you bring in like if I was tomorrow to go to Asia and and to find some grasshopper that's indigenous to the area and smuggle it back into the U.S. and that goes out and it's not native to the U.S. and it goes out and decimates crops and they could prove it was me. I, I think I'm going to jail. Oh yeah, just look at the cro- look at the uh, crackdown that they're doing down in the Everglades now. For if you uh, release a Burmese python there, can you imagine the the ecological? Uh, effects that these guys that these gremlins would have there uh, do you think gremlins are at the top of the food chain or do you think there's think, a, another predator that preys upon gremlins uh, i don't think there's anything but how how have we it, it, how have we never seen these before i don't know how you keep them in the box i, I guess maybe maybe some past uh, historical you know uh, events were actually gremlins that have been disguised as other events. Maybe the Hindenburg was taken down by gremlins, and we don't know. <laughs> That's true, you because know. gremlins are the heroes. We've established that. I think gremlins are the, the next evolutionary step. I agree. So now's the part of the podcast where we uncover some trivia you may or may not have known about gremlins. Big D, did you know that the original director that Spielberg wanted was Tim Burton? Yeah, but I think but, his uh, problem was Burton had not directed anything anything big at this point i think burton would have done a great job with it especially early on his career before he got too cute for his own good i think it would have been visually i think it would have been a lot brighter and it would have been kind of more neon and kind of in your face and i think it also would have been dark i would have loved to have seen it and if they're ever going to do a remake which i've heard rumors of he is the only man for the job so, Big D, it has been confirmed that Gremlins 3 is in the works. According to many sources, including Christopher Columbus and the actors and actresses who played their parts in this movie, the, it would be a sequel. Gremlins 3 would be a, a, a direct sequel to Gremlins 1 and 2, not a reboot or remake. How do you feel about that? Ugh. Gremlins 2 is the only movie I have ever walked out of the theater on. I remember it was awful. So I can't imagine a third. I think a reboot would be good. Uh, do it with, again, somebody like like Tim Burton. See, this is where awesome. I'm going to have to disagree. This is how I'm going to have to disagree with you on this. Gremlins 2, much better. Much better than Gremlins 1. It's like Gremlins Die Hard. Gremlins take over a tower, a building in New York City, and there's much more zaniness, more characters. Uh, There's a singing and dancing number about New York. Oh, it's awesome. So I'm looking forward to a Gremlins 3. My concern is I think they're going to write in the movie that there's going to be a, and mark my words, this is my prediction, there's going to be a super Gremlin. And Gizmo... And lizard gremlins are going to have to band together to defeat super gremlin. That's going to be the plot of the movie. No, the only way I want to see it is if there's Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill in there battling the gremlins. That's that's the only you know, way I want to see it. It would be perfect for this movie. Now that Phoebe Cates has retired from acting, I think it would be the, the perfect character to step in and be Kate's daughter in Gremlins 3 Super Gremlins. You Jennifer realize Lawrence. you want Jennifer Lawrence in every remake we do is a bit creepy. Give it a break. So, Stalk someone else. I bet you have those. So those what else? Uh, leaked photos on your phone, don't you? I don't know which leaked photos you're talking yes, about. Yes, they're probably your wallpaper. I want to see your phone right now. What else do we want to talk about Gremlins, Big D? I think uh, overall, what, what do you, my thoughts on it? Fantastic. I would watch it again. I think it holds up. It was an hour and 40, I think, seven minutes, and it flew by. Of all the movies we've done so far, you know, Big, Weird Science, Pretty Woman, by far, hands down, the best. I think it holds up. Uh, If I'm going to give it back on our, you know, our roles on one 
being like perfect, the perfect shat where you don't even need any TP as to five, which is a complete Taco Bell mess. Ooh, I'm, I'm daring to give it a, a one. It's not perfect, but I think one wipe, one roll of TP. What about you? I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I still had problems with it. I still didn't know exactly what they were trying to be. Was it a comedy? Was it a horror? Was it a 1940s film noir with lots of over narration? In the end, it redefined cinematic movie going by creating its own rating system, PG-13. Hollywood didn't know what to do with this movie. It was kind of a... Trailblazer? Fuck. Was it Was it a trailblazer? Yeah, yeah. It was a trailblazer. There are scenes in this movie that I still really enjoyed for as much as I shat on the plot and the rules. I'm going to give it two and a half shat, two and a half wipes. Two and a half. Are you Can high? I give it two and a half. You're high. Two and a half wipes. So whoa, whoa, okay. wait, 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 wait. So oh, no, you're, no, no, you're no. telling me that this is worse. This is almost pretty woman because you gave pretty woman three. Okay, I'll, listen. I'll give it. I'll give it two wipes. You're, uh, you, there's something wrong with you. No, two wipes. Yep. Okay. I, I got to tolerate. According you, to but- our rating system, according to our rating system, this movie is in need of. It had some serious plot holes. The rules didn't make sense. No one adhered to the rules. The gremlins were truly the the good guys of this movie. I still think that uh, with some tightening up of the script. They could they could do some really good things here with the Gremlins. It's still going to be better than Gremlins Three Super Gremlins. Depends how much shirtless Channing Tatum we get. Oh my God! Can you imagine if Chris Pratt was in it? Oh my God! <laughs> There'd be Gremlins riding motorcycles next to him, and a military subplot about how Gremlins were going to be used by the U.S. military. So in the end, you give it one wipe. I give it two wipes. Overall, chat the movie's official wipe score is one and a half wipes for Gremlins. Go out, download this movie via iTunes or wherever fine movies can be found. How can they find us, Big D, on the interweb? Well, you can find us at the website, shatthemovies.com. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play. You can find us on all the social media. All of them are Shat the Movies. Uh, Also, we want to really give a shout out to uh, the Guys Night who do our theme song, Die Hard. And uh, please hit us up. In the future, what we're going to try to do is we've heard from a bunch of listeners who would like to know what the next week's movie is ahead of time so that they can watch it, then listen to the cast. So what we're going to be doing from here on out is we will be posting the next week's movie uh, the week ahead so that if you want to, you can watch the movie and then listen. Uh, and then you'll be able to give us feedback if you want and send us an email at hosts at shatthemovies.com. So we'll be able to read your emails, feedback, thoughts. So Raj, this week we're going to be doing something a little bit different uh, where we normally go back and look at the 80s and 90s. We're going to be going back into the 70s for a, a one-off and reviewing the 1973 movie Westworld. Uh, besides Shat on the Movies, or Shat the Movies, we also have Shat on TV, where we're going to start covering first-run current television series. So in in order to kind of kick that off right for the HBO series, which starts October 2nd, we're going to be doing a one-off throwback to the 70s. Uh, I hope you everybody enjoys it. Uh, it'll be available next week, and then you could also follow us beside Shat the Movies. You could also follow us on Shad on TV. Hopefully you'll be a fan of Westworld. Uh, we'll be doing the same shtick we do here, reviewing things and hopefully giving you an honest review. Uh, share with your friends. Uh, follow us online. Give us comments. We love it. Gene, keep piling on the Raj. It definitely, definitely does bother him deep in his soul. And uh, as always, remember to leave an empty seat between you and your buddy or everyone around you is going to think you're together.